I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today is Emily Hirsch, Managing Partner at DCDV Group. Emily, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Priscilla. I'm happy to have a little chat with you. All right, so we're here at the Lithium Supply and Markets Conference in Chile. Can you tell our audience what have been the main trends you've seen in the lithium space in 2019? So 2019 has been, uh, I think, a come to Jesus moment for a lot of lithium companies. There has been, uh, I think lithium price has fallen, but lithium stock prices have fallen off a cliff. Um, and from my perspective, I still think that we're in a, in a space where it's too early to say it's going to get better because there are still stocks out there that, in my opinion, are connected with garbage assets mm -hmm. that are trading for the same price as stocks that are associated with very reasonable, albeit early stage and risky, exploration projects. And I think in order to see a change, there needs to the market needs to grow and gain more knowledge so that more investors can differentiate between companies that are, I would say, risky but real versus companies that are playing on a hype. All right, and I guess one of the big uh, talking points or discussions here at the conference has been the London Metal Exchange uh, partnering it up with Fast Markets for this lithium futures contract. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Will it help the industry? What are you seeing in that front? I think the decision is, is an important first step, but I think that over the last year, I guess, there's been a lot of attention paid to the process that the LME went through to choose a partner. Um, and then there's this kind of mindset that now that a partner is chosen, it, you know, it's a it's a meaningful end to a process. Whereas, in my opinion, this is the beginning of something. So the fast markets is being asked to do something that doesn't look like the other products that they price, and that's a reality. Mm -hmm. And so they, within minutes, I think, of announcing it, were faced by the biggest players of the industry saying, "Right, we're not going to use this." And there's a challenge for fast markets now to say, "Okay." What can we do? We can't make everyone happy, and we can't make a product that's perfect right away, but how do we put in place a process whereby we are learning and growing and, and tweaking with the market? Uh, one of the slides that I like to use when I talk to people who aren't so familiar with the lithium industry is I do a little, a little dot that shows the size of the lithium market by year in dollar terms. And I show it tripling and then tripling. And you see this tiny dot getting bigger and bigger. And you're like, what an amazing opportunity. I want to get into that market. But then I put that dot on top of the gold market. And then I put that dot on top of the oil market. And it disappears. You can barely see it. And so it's a industry that's growing so quickly, but influenced, there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of variables, and as those variables change, we know the market's going to grow, but we don't exactly know in what direction. And so I think that the LME contract is always, it's easy to criticize, because it's the first thing in a difficult market. But I think if Fast Markets takes this as the first step in a long journey, rather than you know, waving a trophy around like this, you know, that they've won. Um, I think it could be a great thing. I hope that we see that. All right, and I think uh, here at the event, there's been a lot of talk about innovation, technologies. Maybe can you, can you share your insight in terms of lithium extraction technologies and what are you seeing uh, in the past few years, a few months? So when we talk about lithium extraction technologies, um, you know, everybody, I think, hopefully, everybody listening to this knows that, you, can, you know, currently lithium is extracted from spodumene hard rock or it's extracted from brine. Um, additionally, there are companies that are exploring and putting money into extracting lithium from clays and also from volcanic tuffs. Because the market is so small and growing so quickly, these new technologies have a lot of work to do because they are essentially working on processes to extract lithium from sources that currently no lithium chemicals are extracted from, but that's only because nobody's done it yet. But then within all of that uh, lithium extraction technology noise, a, a lot of the technologies that I see fail very basic tests, which is how much energy does it take? How much heat does it need? What kind of chemical reagents are needed for this process? And what will that cost where that process will take place? Because we're talking about you know, off-grid, typically quite rural, quite challenging environments. Um, and if a, if a lithium extraction technology uh, can't 
talk meaningfully to the energy availability and costs, the availability of this uh, technology to work under different temperature settings and different pressure settings, we're not going to see it commercialized for a long time. It's, it's a reality. That being said, some of the companies that are working with these clay or volcanic tuff deposits are innovating and are working to bring together technological elements from different industries that I think have a fair chance of making the meaningful lithium chemicals for the future. And that's when we get into another segment of the technology in the lithium space that I think is really interesting and worth looking at, which is what's going on in the innovation side inside the battery. You know, specifically solid state is kind of the hot button topic. Um, and it's something that I take a look at the technology companies and also the when you, so solid state, just to kind of give a little bit of a background, when you have a battery, you've got the anode, the cathode, and a liquid electrolyte. And the reason you can't have a lithium metal anode is because if you put lithium metal next to a liquid, it catches on fire. Nobody wants that. However, if you can create a material that mimics the liquid in the sense of allowing the lithium ions to flow back and forth, but is actually a solid, you can get rid of a third of the, the weight and the size in your battery and make much smaller batteries, which enable things like, for example, possibly um, electromobility applied to aviation. That's cool, that's the future. But getting there, again, is a, is a situation where it's difficult to invest in the space. Um, and you see a big, in my mind, a divide between the technologies that are being developed kind of in-house by people like Toyota, for example, um, and a kind of almost Silicon Valley-esque startup culture mm -hmm. and I see the biggest challenge in getting some of these solid state technologies from a laboratory into an actual battery as the manufacturing mm -hmm. because when you're working with materials that are so different than what's in a battery right now you're talking about a need for different manufacturing technologies to enable that to happen at scale and I think that's an area where a lot of the, the a lot of the people who speak technically on solid state technological developments don't understand those manufacturing challenges. Um, and from the raw materials side, the people working in laboratories view access to lithium chemicals and other important raw materials as kind of like an exogenous, you know, a fun story as I was visiting one of the solid state companies um, in the United States, I think in about February, and I asked them where they were planning on getting their lithium metal. And the guy, he said to me, from the catalog. And, and it, that just kind of shows that this is an industry, and one of the reasons I love lithium is because you have to bring together mining and technology, and not just the technology of the battery, but what does the battery enable the vehicle to do, and what vehicles want that type of battery. You have to bring it together. And getting those sides to talk together and to communicate more isn't just about vertical integration to lower costs, but it's about making sure that the people sitting in the lab working on these technologies have at least in the back of their head what has to happen on the extraction side to be able to get this kind of a result. Um, I keep my eye on a lot of, I call them the black boxes for lack of a better word, because the innovations there, when they happen, we're going to see a step change. We're going to see a very meaningful change to lithium extraction. Um, but calling, calling that you know, that's harder to do than the solid state. Solid state, the manufacturing challenges are clear. The time it takes to build, you know, a battery manufacturing facility, the capital, those are clearer numbers. And I'm comfortable saying eight to 10 years. Maybe, you know, fewer than eight to 10 years for portable electronics, fewer than eight to 10 years for drones. But in order to see a solid state battery in a, in a vehicle, in a car that you can buy from Toyota, unless there's in-house technology that I'm not aware of and the people in my circles aren't aware of, eight to 10 years is a comfortable place to sit on that. Um, when it comes to the lithium extraction from alternative sources, harder to call. And, and, and due to the size of the market and how difficult it is to find someone with meaningful experience in the market, that almost exacerbates the fear that especially your sort of large institutional investors have when looking at putting real capital into the lithium market. So I've heard uh, other people also say it's all about solid state, solid state, solid state, but are we getting excited uh, too early? And is there anything that can actually derail this story? Can, can anything happen or is it really we're going to solid state? I think, we're, I think many applications are going to solid state. Um, 
I like to show when I talk about batteries, like batteries are a good philosophical exercise about life. Like a battery, every battery is a trade-off. There's no best battery. There's the best battery for what you want to do, right? So take a, a good example is take a bus versus a Tesla, okay? A bus needs to do, it's constant, you know, the hours per day that it's in use is, is most of the day. And it has a fixed route, so it knows where it's going to be. Uh, it needs to charge and decharge and charge and discharge multiple times a day. But it doesn't really have a range issue. So the battery that you want for a bus is the battery that can do those things the best. Versus a Tesla, you know, every presenter here thinks that in the future everybody's going to need to drive from their house in Connecticut to their other house in Connecticut and not be late for golf. That person has very different needs than an urban city dweller. So a solid state battery is better for applications where energy density is exactly what you need. But some applications don't need that type of energy density. So that might not be the best solution because the thing to understand with a solid state battery, the thing that differentiates it in terms of its performance or how it's gonna behave, right? Um, when you have two solid anodes expanding and contracting in a liquid, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you can see my hands. Like if I put my hands in a bucket and I do this, and then at the end of however many times I do that, I'm just going to have water surrounding my hands. There's not gonna be any gaps. But if I had a bucket of Play-Doh, for example, and I stuck my hands in it and I expand them and contract them and expand them and contract them many times, there's gonna be a lot of empty space between my hands and the Play-Doh. Mm -hmm. In a battery, that causes your battery to catastrophically fail or simply stop working. So any solid state battery comes with technology to make that not happen, which is just going to be expensive and it's going to be at the expense of something else the battery does well. Mm -hmm. So there's no best battery. Mm -hmm. There's the best battery for a certain application. All right, so I'm gonna just switch gears here for a second and I know that uh, another topic that everyone been talking about this year has been supply chains, developing supply chains, security of raw materials from the different countries outside of Asia. What are your thoughts on that? I know that you touched on uh, resource na nationalism um, before. Can you just share some of your thoughts? Absolutely. So resource nationalism, nationalism in general apparently is back, you know, um, and resource nationalism is this sort of n the, the, the sentiment of a country that they need to keep what's theirs. And I think there's, there's good elements to that. Like the, I, the desire to add more value to national resources, I hope comes paired with an open-mindedness towards the idea of sustainable mining, sustainable resource extraction. Like you, you, you can't have, you can't be pro-wind energy and anti-steel mining. You just can't. Or, I mean, I suppose you can, you can do what you want, but that doesn't make sense. And, and kind of like that, in a lot of, you know, I live in Argentina, um, you can't have a battery factory without roads and electricity. But if you use the sort of sentiment around resource nationalism to learn science, be realistic, cooperate, you can use this desire to have a, a secure critical mineral supply chain to pull little bits of the industry and, and, and find new areas of competitive advantage. Right? It doesn't make sense for all of the, for example, brine experimentation to happen in another country. The brine's in Argentina and Chile. That kind of experimentation, the, the science around that could happen locally. But you can't build a battery without importing a lot of things and having roads and energy. Just, you can't. Um, but sort of on top of, on top of that sort of resource nationalism um, idea or bent is there's this kind of idea of China. There's two things that people get very wrong about China. And I'm, you know, I'm no massive China expert, right? But People act like China is one homogenous actor, which is incorrect. The, the lithium industry in China is made up of a, a series of very entrepreneurial, risk-taking, uh, dedicated companies. And these companies are the ones innovating. And that's why they have the technologies that they can go out and look for projects and apply to those projects. It's no, there's no unfair advantage. They've done the work. You know, for the last 20 years, the battery business has been an Asian business. And for the past five or six years, the Chinese have been the ones innovating in lithium. And so when I hear countries like the United States f expressing a desire to compete with China, you don't compete by having a bunch of meetings. Mm -hmm. If you want to compete with China, go make investments in lithium. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really, to me, it's that simple. You know, I work with Chinese clients. Why? Because they're the ones who do it right. 
Great. So um, my last question for you today, I really wanted to touch on the Global Lithium podcast and um, everything that's been happening since last year, this year. What can uh, the people that are watching us today expect from that? And what have you learned in these two seasons of the podcast? Well, I've learned a lot about acoustics. Um, I have... Yeah, I know the past two seasons of the podcast have been great, and Joe and I are very excited about you know, the seasons to come, especially because now that the Global Lithium podcast has become kind of a, a required, required reading, if you will, for a lot of industry participants, we're able to sit down and have meaningful conversations with guests that maybe don't even agree with us um, and, and are willing to sit down for an hour and slog through some of these hard issues and, and kind of be the... Think, think something through together, maybe bring some new ideas out without being didactic. Um, I've learned, you know, I, Joe and I do a lot of these trips together and we've learned how to p try to pair that with getting guests or, or, or taking advantage of where we are to get someone to talk to us about something. Um, we did a great one with uh, Dr. Eduardo Betran of mm -hmm. Corfo here last year that was, I, I learned so much. I learned something from every guest, and I go back and re-listen to, especially the more technical episodes, because if you want to understand how a battery works, David Deke and Dan Blundell speaking for an hour about how a battery works is really helpful. Um, and I'm also able to ask questions to some of these people that I think some people have the same questions as me, mm -hmm. and maybe don't have the opportunity, or they're afraid that it'll look bad to ask a dumb question, like, look, I'll ask them all, yeah. right? Um, and I've learned how to turn a hotel room into a sound studio by like ordering all the extra blankets and stacking them up over everything. Um, so when, in this trip, we actually, we sat down with Chloe Holtzinger of Lux Research, who's probably one of the best minds on where battery technology is going. Um, and also with Dr. Yuan Gao of Poolid um, to talk about cathode materials and how they work and what, what are the constraints. So I'm hoping we are going to have more and more technical guests mixed in with some of your CEOs and your companies so that we can actually facilitate the type of communication that, that Joe and I are talking about, which is people in the industry need to get together and communicate and talk and realize that they're doing something new, which means trying ideas, maybe they don't work, trying something else, finding someone who knows more about this and like, you know, just kind of getting cool, smart science people together and doing awesome stuff. All right, Emily, thank you so much for being here today. No, thank you. Right, once again, I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today was Emily Hirsch, managing partner at DCDV Group.